once we have, this is why I wanted to delay it. Once we have this done, most people at this point would grab a face plate and they would put a face plate on the back side of it and they would turn this off of the face plate. Well, we don't do that. We turn it off of the screw chuck. Now, uh, you'd think, well, how can you turn a 16 inch blank off of a screw chuck? Well, you can turn any size blank off of a screw chuck if you do it right. These come with every chuck that you buy, but they're, this screw chuck are, will only fit this chuck. So you can't take another manufacturer's screw and put it in somebody else's chuck because this little gap right there is designed to fit this chuck and it won't seat correctly in anybody else's chuck. And I've got three chucks and every one of them has got a different screw. So, and if you do not seat this properly in this chuck, then it, it will defeat itself because it'll get loose and that's what it'll do. So when you're seating one of these, make sure, see that's, I, I, I keep wiggling it to make sure that that little piece that goes down into that cut that's in there is seated down in it. Uh, Clem Steubing, you know, uh, remember the club, he bought a brand new chuck with one of these. And he came over and brought it one day and he said, I just bought this thing and I've used it one time and this screw bent. He said, why? And I said, did you seat it properly into the chuck? And he said, what do you mean? Well, he didn't get it seated properly into those little grooves and, and he had a pretty good blank on there. It worked itself loose and it bent the screw. So that's what it'll do. Now, what makes this screw chuck hold is not the, not the screw itself, but it's the chuck. Can you hold it? If you pull this with the screw, I don't care how big this blank is, if you pull this up against that chuck, the face of that chuck is what does the holding. All the screw does is hold it against the face of the chuck. So that's on there tight. Pardon? Whole thing? Okay, how's that? Okay. But can you see that on the screen that this is dead up against that blank? And as long as it stays that way, this, this blank is not going anywhere. anywhere. Now the second thing we do is we bring up the tailstock and I'll, uh, with a point on it, and I'll run the tailstock up against that before I ever turn the lathe on. And now it cannot go anywhere. I don't care how big it is. <laughs> now, I said a while ago it was important for these to be kind of uniform. And this is, I'll show you why. When you get this on the lathe and you turn it, if that is not, if, if this end is wider than that end, then this end down here, and I wish I'd have brought one, and this one's not bad. This thing, this face will be sitting here at a, a, a cocked angle. And this is the face that's important. It's not this face so much back here. Uh, push the button. If that occurs, if you have cut one like that, just put it in there. Show you what you can do. You can take a shim like this. And let's say that this is, is cocked like that. Now, if you leave it cocked like that, what will happen to you when you start turning that blank is that you'll have to turn away a lot more on one side than you have to turn away on the other side. 
So your bowl is going to wind up smaller is what it amounts to. So I try to straighten that up because I, I want this, this face to be running as flat as possible before I ever start turning. And if it's way off, I'll mark the back side and I'll take a shim. I'll stick it between the chuck and I'll hold it at where, it where it needs to be and I'll tighten it back up. See that shim's staying in the same place and because it's staying in the same place, it will straighten out. You see how it, it, this one was fairly straight, but now it's not. But you see what the effect the shim had on it. And, and that's just as strong with that shim in there as it is up against it, as long as you do it, get it tight, okay? So that's a way to correct if you make a, if you make a mistake in the sawing. That's a way to correct it. Okay. And the next thing I want to talk about is sometimes, okay, you can turn it loose. We won't, we won't get that real round. See, that's not running real round at, at all, as you can see. And when you turn the lathe on, probably at 500 RPM, the lathe is going to start shaking. And you do not want to run this, even with the tailstock up, uh, at, at a speed that causes the lathe to shake. And you can get four to 500 RPM probably, but you just keep bringing up the RPM until it starts to shake and then you back it off. Now, most, most folks would take a bow gouge and they would turn the lathe on and you'd start right here and you'd start going across this like this. Is that the way y'all do it, to, to round them up? Okay, well, we don't do it that way. We know that we want to shape this bow, and this is going to be the bottom of the bow. So why beat yourself up? We start out here, and we start on that edge right there, and we start taking that edge off. And we just keep taking that edge off until, the, until we get to a point to where we're, we're, we're running on the bevel. And the more of that edge you take off, and the more of this off, the more ballast it becomes, and the more RPM, RPM you can put on it. But we keep on going from this point here. We don't go across this surface out here. It's a lot faster, and you don't have to cut the same stuff twice, is what it amounts to. So if you're cutting these things, start back here and cut that corner off, and just keep cutting that corner off till you get the shape of the bow you want. Does that make sense? OK. Anybody got any questions at this point? Either you already know all of this or I'm not explaining it very well. <laughs> okay. Somehow you've got to get this bow or this blank in a position to where you can finish it. And the only way you can do that is dry it. So what we do with them is we shape them. Uh, to 10%, the thickness, we bring them down to 10% of their diameter. Now this bowl was, was green, and then I dropped this into a barrel I have there in the shop that uh, contains 10 gallons of methyl alcohol. I was using denatured alcohol. It costs $15 a gallon. And you go through it, it depends on how many bowls you put in it, but what, what's happening when you put this in the alcohol is that the alcohol is soaking into the wood and it's replacing the water that's in the cells of the wood. So that water is now coming out into your alcohol. And eventually it'll get water saturated and it'll quit working. Uh, but I discovered that methyl alcohol, I, I was trying to find a cheaper product, uh, methyl alcohol is used in the oil fields and it's used as a, an antifreeze. But it has 
pretty much the same properties as denatured alcohol. And I got online because I was concerned about uh, holdover residue in the, in the bowl. And I read everything I could read about methyl alcohol and I found nothing that said that once, once this was exposed to the air and dried that there was anything left uh, in the bowl. So I switched to methyl alcohol. And the reason was that it's $5 a gallon. <laughs> you can buy a five-gallon five gallon can for $20, $25. So it, it took a lot of the cost away from drying. Okay, we drop these in the alcohol barrel and we leave them in there for two days. Then I take them out and I put them out on my drying rack outside. By using alcohol, this bowl will dry down to about 8% moisture depending on the outside temperature but in the summertime they'll dry in about three weeks if you take the same bowl and put it in shavings and put it in a box under your bench you know you can pull it out nine months to a year down the road and you can finish it maybe but we we can finish it within three months now this is another thing you need if you're going to do this kind of stuff. It's a little moisture meter. It costs 30 bucks. And I go out and I check them every now and then. This one is now down below six. Uh, if you, if I take them, I generally bring them back in the shop when they're at eight percent and by the time I get around to finishing them they'll be down to six or below. If you just bring it in at 8%, put it on the lathe, and finish it, the, the, the cutting and the sanding process of finishing that bow will bring it down below 5%. So just from the heat that you generate. And the bow will not move uh, if it's... You can go buy wood out of the lumber yard that's been he uh, heat... Yeah kill dried and it'll have five percent moisture in it. It's uh, it's still you said you're using alcohol then you're putting it outside for three weeks. Do you what what kind of breakage crackage do you have? Because generally what I've heard what I've done is wrap the outside with craft paper and don't do anything. I don't do anything. Uh, I, I would have to say that the, the only time that I get crackage in a bowl, and I, I, I could have brought one, is if I don't get far enough away from the pith on my rim, then I'll get cracking on the rim right around that pith. Uh, and sometimes I've had to cut away and make a shallower bowl. But as far as the bowl itself cracking, no, I've never had a I've never had a bowl crack, and I don't wrap them in anything. I've got a what I my drying rack is a twenty foot ladder <laughs> that's hanging under my shed, and it's in it's not out in the sun, it's in the shade. But uh, uh, and I check them, and and it may take three weeks, it may take four weeks, it depends on the outside ambient temperature. But if you're wanting to turn bowls and you're wanting to dry them quickly, uh, that's about the only way I know to dry them quickly is, is to invest in the alcohol and uh, a, a barrel to put it in. I wanted, I, I had a lot of trouble finding a barrel uh, because I wanted to be able to soak uh, up to a 15 inch bowl. And I thought maybe one of those 25 gallon grease barrels you know, would work, but it won't. It's not big enough for a 15-inch bowl. And this guy that I buy the stuff from, he also has a car wash. And he thought about it, and he called me, and he said, you know, one of my soap containers might work. And it's a plastic barrel. And sure enough, I got one from him, and uh, it works perfect. And it's about that tall, and a 15-inch bowl will go right into it. And it... Uh, and it's got a lid on it. And that's one thing, if you do this alcohol thing, always put it in a container that, and keep it in a container that you can put a lid on because it will evaporate if you don't keep a lid on it. And that's pretty expensive evaporation. 
Anybody got any questions about drying? Has anybody had experience with using like a flexible fold, like a, some of these uh, large Ziploc bags or so? Put the bowl in there and enough uh, alcohol to cover it up? Or, or, uh, you could do that. I don't uh, hurt the plastic, I wonder. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't hurt this plastic barrel, uh, so I don't know if it would damage the a plastic bag or not. But that's the biggest problem. I tried doing it in a five-gallon bucket to start with, and I and I did a lot of them in a five-gallon bucket. But it will not. About a 11-inch bowl is about as big as you can get in a five-gallon bucket. Uh, so uh, there's some woods, bodark. You can take a piece of bodark right off the tree and you can turn a bowl out of it, complete to finish, sand it, and it will not move. You can take a piece of mesquite right off of a tree, green as a gourd, throw water at you when you're turning it, sand it down, put a finish on it, and it will not move. Just the characteristics of the woods. But those two woods especially bodark, will not move. I don't ever soak bodark and I don't soak mesquite. I just turn them. Now if you're doing natural edge bowls, it's not necessary to soak them in the alcohol. Put them on the lathe, turn them to finish, and put a finish on them. But it is important for you to finish it when you start it. Because if you let it sit there overnight, when you come back the next day to finish it, it will have changed shape so radically that it'll beat you to death when you try to sand it. So when you're doing anything that, that's going to be... And, and this is another thing about these bowls also. When I put one of these back in the lathe to finish it, I don't walk away from it and leave it the day before because they will move sometimes on the lathe. And then when you come back to them, they're not, they're not round and so they're harder it just makes it so much harder. So when you start one, to f take it to finish. You know, finish it and put a finish on it. But uh, right then, don't don't let it set in the lathe overnight, unless it's bodark or mesquite, and then you can pretty much do what you want to. Also, when you dry these, they are going to change shape. And I've not found I've not had a bowl yet that that ten percent of thickness didn't take care of that. I was able to go back, turn the outside, get it round again, and then round up the inside to the thickness I wanted, and I had plenty of wood to do it. Now, it's not absolutely necessary, uh, but, but your tenon is going to be oblong that's on the back, and your foot is going to be oblong. So what I do with them, if that comes back up here, I'll show you what take the out of there. What you can do let me let me borrow that a minute and then I'll bring it back around. What you can do with this and I, I don't have a a point, but you can take that out of the way and I'll just I'll just do it. Is I just take the chuck like it is right here and I turn that around just like that. And I've got a point in here, a live center in here, and I bring that up. In that toolbox? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. Oh, the spiral, dude. It didn't. I just want something with a point on it. That'll work. Uh, that would be a live center instead of that right there. But I'll bring that up, and I've, I've, and that's one thing you want to always make sure you do is mark your center on that, on this tenon before you put it in the alcohol before you get through it. Now, if I bring that up there, and I turn that lathe on with the live center, see that's fairly centered, and now I can round up this tenon again, and I, and at the same time I go ahead and round up my foot, and I, and I square off the top of my foot because all of that is out of shape. Then I don't have to mess with that. Once I round it, once I turn it around and put it back in the chuck and round this, get this round again, I've already got all this done. 
And uh, so that's a real quick way to round your tenant up. At first, I didn't think you needed to do that. But I found that if you do that, it takes less cutting to get this back into shape here if your tenon starts out round. And I turned a lot of them with an oblong tenon, but it, it works a whole lot better if you'll do this and round that back up before you start shaping the outside of it. Yeah, I'm through with that. Okay. We've talked about band saws. Oh, I want to talk to one other thing about logs. When you're out selecting logs, uh, I do not mind turning a bowl, and I've got a couple of walnut ones I hope will work out. I do not mind turning a bowl that has a lot of imperfections in it. Uh, I turned one recently that, uh, and, and if you'll look for this, if you see a log or a piece of a tree trunk and it has a broken, a place where a limb has broken off of it and the limb has tried to sear over on the top, meaning it's been that way a long time, Everything that is on the outside of that log goes all the way to the pith. Every limb goes all the way to that pith. So everything on the outside is going to show up on the inside when you turn that. And this, this particular log had one of these on it. And when I turned it down inside the log, it was all honeycombed. It was solid but it was, had little honeycombs everywhere in there. And so when I finished the bowl, then I went back and I filled all those honeycombs with turquoise. And it made a, it just, I mean, it, it was just a totally different bowl. And I took it to the gallery and it sold one day. So any, everything that we put turquoise on is gone the next day after we've taken it down there. So look for logs that might indicate that there's going to be an imperfection in that bowl when you turn it if you want to enhance that, if you're into that, if you're into inlays and turquoises and stuff like that. But we like that. We like to, uh, for some knots. A lot of times you'll turn and there'll be, a, there'll be a bark intrusion way down in the log. And that's from a broken limb a long, long time ago. And we like those because they create a void of some kind in there that we can fill up with something else. So look at the outside of the logs whenever you're cutting them, if you're interested in that kind of thing. And if you can find imp imperfections on the outside of the log, the chances are they're going to show up on your bowl blank. And they're going to give you an opportunity to create something there with that. So. Okay, anybody got any questions? That's pretty much from the tree to the bowl. And uh, we, we, I didn't do any turning, as you can see, because I think most everybody can, do, can turn. Uh, one other thing he asked me to do, and I'll, I'll do it very quickly. Does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about so far? Can hold that log still on the cutting block when you're chainsawing? Chainsawing it? I have a... I have a log that's about gay tall, and I've cut a V in it, and that V stabilizes the log. And, and that's really basically all you've got to do is just cut a V in it, something, a cradle for it, some way to, like that. Yes. Yeah, if you, if you try to cut that line, from the top of that log, you'll be here till tomorrow. Well, it didn't take me till tomorrow, but it wasn't straight. Huh? It wasn't straight, but I did it one day. Yeah, that's the hard way to do it. Because <laughs> what you're doing, you're cutting across every one of those rings in that log. If you lay it down on its side and cut it with those grains, that, that chainsaw will just, just fly through it. 
Yeah, don't don't cut them from up here down. Lay them on their side. Yeah, don't don't do it the other way. Uh, I tried that one time and I, I didn't try it again. It took a long time, didn't it? Yeah. Just lay it down on its side and mark it. What I I mark both ends like this, and then and and I put a mark on where I can see it up on top, and then I go f between those two marks on the chainsaw, and then you can follow your line on the front. And you just got to be careful to make sure it's real easy to get that chain going this way instead of vertical straight down through the log. So it. it if you start it and you see ah, it's going crooked, just back out and start over and straighten it up. I mean, you'll have, because what you're messing up is this right here. You're not messing this up, but just start over. But yeah, lay the, I should have mentioned that. Lay the log down flat on your cutting block and cut it lengthwise. Don't cut it from the top down. 